Yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody to uh, another program here at the Miamisburg History Center. My name is Ken Ballinger. I'm the president of the Miamisburg Historical Society. Um, behind the camera, we have John Warrington, who is our media committee chair. Uh, our curator, Gary Pettigrew, is here with us. Martha Ballinger, who is our program chair and is one of the people who brought us uh, this program this evening. Uh, Susan Martin is one of our new board members. And so, uh, Glad to have everyone here this evening. Please come in. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Kevin Brown, who has taught anthropology, archaeology, and history at York College of Pennsylvania for 20 years. He retired in December of 2019. And he also has been playing the bagpipes for 50 years and participated in many um, First World War reenactments uh, over 30 years. He's a 1978 history graduate of York College of Pennsylvania, received his master's degree in Near Eastern Archaeology from Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and his PhD in Egyptian Archaeology from Cardiff University in Wales. Nice. Dr. Brown has worked on archaeological projects from New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North and South Carolina, Caesarea Maritima in Israel, Abu Shar in, in Egypt, uh, Meanstoke, England, and four sites on the Gettysburg, Pennsylvania battlefield. He has developed expertise in excavation, dig supervision, artifact cataloging, report graphics, photography, site surveying and mapping, burial exhumation, and report writing. All abilities that aid Dr. Brown's continuing interest in history military history, and archaeology. So if you would please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Brown. This is a place where I say, don't back throw money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Um, oh, I can get up here without tripping. Yeah, I think that's got it. Oh, I need my clicker. Yes, well, that's up here, right. All right, well, thanks for the gratifying turnout. Glad you could all come along. And uh, my talk tonight is on the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And 200 years ago, um, on the 4th of November, this tomb was discovered by um, by uh, uh, Howard Carter, and uh, it was a, a long involved story really as to how he found it. So anyway, uh, let's take a look at some of the players, and I also want to talk a little bit tonight about um, uh, Tutankhamun himself, because as famous as he is today because of the discovery of his tomb, he really wasn't that important in his own day. So, uh, let me explain why here. Okay, so, um, right, um, Tutankhamun uh, was only a boy when he came to the throne. He was only about nine years of age. Um, he was the son of a pharaoh by the name of Akhenaten. Now, Akhenaten uh, was a very singular fellow in the fact that he thought there were too many gods and goddesses in Egypt and he decided that there should only be one god that they should worship um, called the Aten, which was the sun god. And so he's oftentimes known as the heretic pharaoh, and he led a religious revolution um, as a result of his uh, ideas about religion here. Um, when he died, his religion didn't really survive him. And when uh, he did die, the next really, uh, legitimate pharaoh that came to power was indeed Tutankhamun. As a matter of fact, Tutankhamun's name was originally Tutankhaten, and he changed that uh, because his uh, uh, vizier, who was his prime minister, and his general, Horemhab, um, both of them said, look, you know, Egypt is in trouble, and if you don't want trouble in your reign, you really need to readopt the old gods, and that's what Tutankhamun did. Um, so, in a lot of ways, this young boy was pretty much told what he needed to do, even though he was the pharaoh. Um, what we see here 
Um, now, I should say, too, that um, he was a pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and that is the time period of what we call the New Kingdom, or the Empire period. Uh, it was during this time that Egypt rose to its pinnacle of, of power uh, in the ancient Near East there. Um, the 18th dynasty went from uh, 1332 to about 1323 uh, BC. Um, that's, uh, that's actually when he um, you know, uh, uh, reigned there. And his tomb was discovered almost intact. That's why he's so important to this day. Now, as I said, 100 years ago uh, on the 4th, and one of the things about this tomb, we had uh, almost never discovered a tomb that was totally intact. This tomb was probably broken into twice, but before they could really uh, carry away much of the, uh, the contents, it was, they were discovered and they were chased away or caught or whatever, and the tomb was resealed. So when this tomb was eventually rediscovered in 1922, it had nearly all of its, uh, of its uh, uh, contents. The important part about this is that when you realize Tutankhamun was almost an afterthought during his own time period, the, the archaeologist said, if this is the kind of stuff that a pharaoh who was relatively unimportant was buried with, just imagine what somebody like Ramses II uh, or uh, uh, Tatmose III or some of those really great pharaohs, imagine what they would have been buried with. And we don't know, simply because um, most of those tombs were, were robbed out and very little, if anything, was left in them. Uh, so this answered many questions about life in Egypt at this time. Um, this is one of the uh, tomb paintings, and what you see here is uh, Tutankhamun, and he's there with the god uh, Anubis, who was one of the gods of the afterlife, and the goddess Hathor. Okay, And uh, both of them are holding up uh, well, uh, Hathor is holding up the symbol of life, indicating that she's the one giving life to Tutankhamun. And how do we know who these people are? Well, when we take a look at this, um, it, it uh, tells us who these things are. This is Hathor, the um, lady of the heavens, a uh, leader of Amentet, which is the west. That was where the land of the dead was. So that's who we know this is. Then we have the good god, uh, uh, Men er, uh, yeah, Keperu uh, Nebra, which is one of the names of Tutankhamun. And he was given life, okay, forever, uh, for eternity. And then this, of course, is Anubis. And this is uh, Anubis, the uh, leader of the West, the good god, um, the, uh, uh, let's see, the lord of heaven, right? That's what the hieroglyphics say there, all right? Now, uh, let's see. Now, this is the reason why I say um, that um, Tutankhamun uh, had problems. He wasn't only just nine years old when he came to the throne. He died at 18. And if you take a look, this is um, a, uh, uh, what they've done with the skeletal remains, and they've been able to take the skull and re-imagine uh, how he actually would have looked. Now, this isn't su a surprise, because we actually have uh, the police do these kind of things today to uh, look at murder victims and things of this nature. So uh, we're pretty certain that this uh, representation of Tutankhamun is probably pretty close to correct on that. Um, the other thing, too, because of his pelvic structure, we know he was related to Akhenaten because we know that Akhenaten is always depicted with his sort of wide hips there, which prompted some people to suggest that Akhenaten's father may have been a hermaphrodite, in other words, having sexual organs of both males and females, right? Mm. Okay, so his physical health. Now, they've done CT scans on the mummy. And by the way, uh, Tutankhamun's mummy they kind of overdid it a little bit. His is not one of the best mummies out there. Um, they actually put too much in the way of uh, sacred oils on him, and it kind of ruined the mummification process. So his is not a tremendously well-preserved mummy, really. But we are able to get some things. We did uh, CT scans, and a couple of things happened. We know that he uh, had malaria 
likely not too long before he died. And they think that may have been uh, part of the reason why he succumbed to uh, you know, uh, his, his injuries of a fractured lower leg. Now we know again that this was uh, uh, an injury sustained not too long before his death. We know that because the bones have not totally healed. Now the other things here, we know that he was born with a clubbed foot. And this is, you know, if you look down here, you can certainly see how that uh, um, you know, would have been impeding him with his walking. You notice he has a cane, and in his tomb was about three or four different canes. So we know that he used these most of his life. Um, several of the vertebrae in his upper spine were fused. Now this was really kind of a, a bad thing because what happens is with those vertebrae being fused like that, if you called to him and say, hey, two thousand and one, and he couldn't just say, turn his head and say, yeah, what do you want? He would have had to have done this. Yes. You know, because he actually couldn't turn his neck. Now, again, some people have suggested that one of the things that may have killed him is he may have suffered a fall out of a chariot and landed on the back of his neck and basically broken his spine, and they think that might have killed him. But um, that seems to have fallen out of favor is, is one of the reasons why he died. We know, too, that he had a cleft palate. We know he had an elongated head. And you can kind of see that, uh, you know, that uh, does give you a bit of an elongated shape, even though you can't see it from the, the, from the side. And we know he had a curved spine, okay? Now, with the exception of the malaria and the lower leg fractures, um, all of these traits are uh, associated with inbreeding. Uh, we do know that um, because of DNA, we know that he was related to uh, Amenhotep the fourth or Akhenaten. We know that he was uh, very closely related to his wife, who was probably a half-sister. Um, they, they did practice incest uh, there in Egypt, where they tried to keep the bloodlines pure. So what they did is they married close relatives in that. Now, obviously, when you do that, you have people that end up with six toes and things of that nature. And you have these kind of problems crop up. Um, hemophilia is another one. He did not have hemophilia. but that was certainly something that could have happened with him. Um, a lot of people thought that uh, perhaps he might have had Marfan's syndrome. Um, but in actuality, when you look at the skeletal remains and the D uh, DNA tests uh, also showed that no, he did not have Marfan's d uh, disease at all. Okay? So we did get quite a bit of, of DNA uh, evidence on Tutankhamun. Okay. Now, as a pharaoh, as I said, he had rather limited success. Um, he only ruled for nine years. Okay? He married his sister, Ankhus Pa'aten, okay? and about, you know, uh, he was about 12 or 13 probably when he got married. You've got to realize again that basically when a young fellow or a young woman went through puberty, they, as soon as they could have children, they pretty much were considered adults. And uh, you, you found that the average Egyptian probably didn't live past about 45, okay? Now, there were other uh, people out there. For instance, Ramesses II, uh, pharaoh, uh, the uh, second, uh, third pharaoh of the, uh, uh, of the 19th dynasty, reigned for 67 years. So some people did live longer, but the average Egyptian, 40 to 45. And so um, he would have been a, a young man at, at 12 or 13. Okay, so he married um, his sister, and uh, when they changed the religions back to the old religions, she became Akhenaten. Okay, um, he returned the, uh, the Egypt to the old polytheistic cults, and he did a lot of building. Uh, he did do that at Karnak and Luxor, and if you go to Luxor, for instance, the temple there, you can see the uh, areas where he did build because it's got his name uh, on them. And this is an interesting one, too. Uh, he was supposedly led military campaigns in uh, Nubia, which is south of Egypt, and then uh, in Syria and Palestine. Now, there's no question that uh, they probably did have military campaigns that went into those areas to reestablish uh, Egyptian control over those areas. But the idea of him leading them, probably not. You know, 
Um, when you take a look at uh, you know, his figure and that, does that look like a warrior to you? Certainly doesn't to me, right? So likely um, um, his generals did this, and of course, <coughs> being Pharaoh, he would have been given credit, but he probably actually didn't lead them. All right, so that kind of gives you a bit of a background of, of his life. Uh, nothing too, uh, too terribly exciting, really. Uh, and he kind of was told what to do by his vizier and his uh, general for a lot of his life and that. So he dies, uh, as I say, in 18, um, kind of unexpectedly. And we think that the tomb that he was put into was probably for somebody else. They had it only partially done. And when he died, they finished it off. And he was buried quite quickly. Well, we fast forward to 1922, okay, um, or that era. Um, the individual who finances this project is George Herbert, who is the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Um, he, uh, he was born in 1866 and lived till 1923 and died of mysterious circumstances, we, we understand. Um, now, here's the thing. As you, you see here, he had a serious interest in cars. But he had a car accident, and his doctors advised him to spend time in a warm climate. And so um, uh, he chose Egypt. And he decided that um, he really enjoyed Egypt a lot and became a really enthusiastic amateur um, uh, Egyptologist and archaeologist. He had never trained, though, in archaeology. And so what he needed was someone who did really have um, an expertise in this. And he found such an individual in Howard Carter. Now, um, just so you know as well, if you're talking about the wealth of Carnarvon, uh, George Herbert, um, this is where he lived, High Clare Castle. Now, I don't know, um, some of you may recall the series Downton Abbey, right? Well, Downton Abbey, they used High Clare Castle uh, as, the, uh, as Downton Abbey there for, for the Grantham family. And by the way, interestingly enough, now this is, the, the family's been there from 1679, but this particular building was designed and uh, built around 1842, uh, the present building. This still stands today, and you still can go see it. And by the way, they still have a room there where there are artifacts from Tutankhamun's tomb uh, there in High Clare Castle. Okay, well, the individual that uh, um, Lord Carnarvon uh, found uh, in order to uh, do his excavation was this fellow, Howard Carter. Okay? Um, he lived quite a, a long time, died uh, in 1939. Um, he didn't have a lot of education. Uh, he was the son of a, uh, a worker in Warwickshire, I think it was, and uh, he uh, ended up uh, going to, with his father, to, um, you know, uh, uh, Lady Amherst's castle there, uh, and uh, he had nothing to do, but he was a very talented artist, he found. And she had Egyptian artifacts, and he would spend time drawing those. Eventually, Lady Amherst said, well, you know what, he's got a lot of talent, and I know uh, that people in the a Egypt Exploration Fund, they have real need for people who are good artists and that. This young fellow has real talent. So she introduced him to Percy Newberry, who was at that time uh, excavating the Middle Kingdom uh, period tombs at Beni Hassan. And uh, Newberry took him on as, a, as an artist. From there, um, you know, uh, Carter ends up going and working with Flinders Petrie and uh, some of the other things. Ends up getting a, uh, a job with the Egyptian Antiquities Service. Uh, there and and even though he does not have any university degrees at all, he learned to be a very competent archaeologist in the field, and he learned from some of the best. Um, it wasn't until 1907 that Lord Carnarvon finally said to Carter, "Look, I'm trying to. I'm interested in in sponsoring digs, but I need an archaeologist. Would you come work for me?" And so um, Carter said yes. So their association begins about 1907 or so. Now, I should explain, too, though, that um, in order to uh, dig in Egypt, you needed to get a permit from the Egyptian government to be able to do that. And they would only allow certain number of permits to work in places like the Valley of the Kings. All right? 
So when one fellow's um, uh, permit ran out, Carnivan applied for it, got it, and said, okay, let's go. So um, the first season that Carter worked there was 1914, the summer of 1914. Mm -hmm. And they ran a, 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 a session. Um, they were looking for Tutankhamun's tomb. Why were they looking for it? Because in the Valley of the Kings here, in, in several areas along here, they found small artifacts that had been dropped with his name on it. And Carter said, I'm sure he has to be here somewhere, but we don't know where. Now, a lot of these tombs um, are, uh, are large tombs. They have been robbed out, but we know who owns them because their names are in the tombs and that. Um, but Tutankhamun's tomb was not discovered, and they had no idea where it was. The problem is that in 1914, in August, on the 4th of August, Britain declared war on Germany, entering World War I. And as a result, um, the uh, Turks, who were on the side of the Germans, pushed toward Egypt, trying to take the Suez Canal. So Egypt was under real threat. So Carter left archaeology temporarily and worked as a courier and a translator for the British Army and the French as well, um, to, uh, because he also spoke Arabic. He was able to talk with the Arab tribesmen who were revolting against the Turks. Well, anyway, by 1917, by that time, um, the British had pushed the uh, Turks out of uh, the Sinai Peninsula and were up in, in the area of Israel. And Egypt was pretty safe at that point. So uh, Carter resigned his position as a uh, interpreter and, and courier and uh, ended up going back in, in late 1917 uh, to archaeology. So. Um, he ran a season, a short season there, uh, as I understand, and uh, of course then 1918, 1919, uh, on through uh, 1920 and 1921. And all the while he was looking for Tutankhamun's tomb. Looked all over the Valley of the Kings, right? Couldn't find anything, but still kept finding these little tidbits that says it's here somewhere, right? Well. Here's where there was a, a series of workers' huts, right here in front of the tomb of Ramesses VI. And these worker huts had been there since antiquity. And he said, that's the only place I haven't looked yet. Carnivan said to him, look, Carter, I put out a lot of money. We haven't found anything. I think this is the last season here in 1921. Carter says, please, there's one more place. Will you just give me money enough for one more season? Carnivan said, all right, fine, okay. So what happens? Okay, well, here's the tomb of Ramesses VI, okay? A big tomb, I mean, obvious, you know, that it's there and that type of thing. This is where the workers' huts were, right in through here, right? Well, what happens? He clears away those, uh, those ancient workers' huts, gets a nice flat surface and starts to excavate. And on the 4th of November, 1922, one of his workers called him over and said, Sahib, you have to see, or Effendi, you have to see something, um, you know, I've just discovered. And Carter looked at it, and it looked like a stair. And he said, okay, clear some more and then see if this is actually a stair or it, it, this is just something buried in the ground. And they cleared a few more away, and before you know it, they had three or four steps, uh, you know, cleared away. And he said, oh, I think we're on to something here. So he said, clear out all the rest of it. Go, go right down to the bottom of the steps, which they did do. And they got down to the doors. And the doors had thick rope tied around the handles and that sort of thing. And it was sealed with a clay impression. And that clay impression said, Tutankhamun. And he said, I think I found it. <laughs> well, sure enough, he did. So this is as it looks today. This is the, the tomb of, of Ramesses VI is still there. And here's where you know, the stairs that go down into Tutankhamun's tomb uh, are. All right, well. OK, so this, as I say, is a small tomb. Now, I've been in the uh, tomb of Horemheb and uh, the tomb of, of uh, Seti II and uh, uh, Amenhotep II, I think it was. Uh, that's there in the Valley of the Kings, and they're really long. They're really long, and, and they're really magnificent when you go into them. 
This is a very small tune compared to them, all right? Here's the steps that they found, 16 steps down, and here's a blocked passageway. This is the door they found with the rope um, you know, and the seal on it. And they broke that open, and they went down this passage. And sure enough, they did find a couple of trinkets, a couple of artifacts down here in this passage. And he got to this, and he realized that's really where the, the tomb would start. And he said, OK, hold up. I can't go any further here. I need to send a, a telegram to Lord Carnarvon and let him know what's going on. Three weeks later, Carnarvon shows up in Egypt, right? The two of them go down into the, the uh, passage there, they go to that, and the workers, the Egyptian workers and, and uh, Carter um, start to break through and they get enough of a hole in there that Carter can stick his head in and stick a lantern in. And he sticks his head in and he uh, sticks the lantern in there and sees the, 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 the light glinting uh, off of, of artifacts and, and metal and, and some gold. And, you know, uh, Carnivan's behind him and says, Carter, what do you see? And the only thing Car uh, that Carter can say is, you know, he said, can you see anything? He says, yes, wonderful things, <laughs> right? Well, it was really because, you know, he realized very quickly this tomb had nearly been untouched. So they broke through this, this uh, here's the antechamber, right, okay, and uh, I've got photographs and I'll tell you about them when we do it. There was another doorway here that they could see and they broke through that and this is the annex, all right, and then this wall, there's a wall here and a door, they broke through that. This is the actual burial chamber where they had the, um, where they had the uh, uh, shrine and, and the sarcophagus and that type of thing. And then there's the treasury here that was off of that with more goods and that. And this is also where the canopic jars um, that in, you know, contained all of Tutankhamun's uh, stomach and lungs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, remember, when they mummified people, they took those things out of the body because that would destroy the mummification process. But they knew that the, the individual needed <laughs> the lungs and the stomach and all that sort of thing in the afterlife. So they, you know, mummified those and put them into the tomb along with them, even if they weren't in the body, all right? So there we have it. Um, now, this is north, so this is your north wall, this is your south wall, this is your east wall, and this is your west, all right? So let me uh, show you some of these. Now, the uh, Carter, when he found this, he knew that he needed to have somebody who could take pictures, right? Um, he needed somebody who knew what they were doing. It just so happens the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City had a photographer there in Egypt working. His name was Harry Burton. And Carter, uh, you know, uh, talked to the people from the Met and said, look, you know, could I borrow him? And they said, yeah, sure, okay, right. So Harry Burton was the one who took these photographs. This is one of his photographs. Now, I will tell you this. This photograph, of course, was in black and white. Only recently has someone uh, had the skill to be able to colorize these. So you know, you, these are not, you cannot see these all that easily in this day and age uh, yet because you can see the black and white ones, but these are uh, the colorized versions. And they, this is what Carter and them would have seen. This is the north wall, and you can see here, this is the entrance into the burial chamber. It's still, they haven't even uh, cracked through that yet. Hmm. Um, different caskets here. Notice the uh, vases that he would have needed. The two guards here that were um, mm -hmm. you know, guarding the entrance into the burial chamber. Um, we see uh, this is a bed in, in the shape of a uh, uh, jaguar, okay? Uh, caskets of, of jewelry and that sort of thing. Um, you see, uh, let's see, there's uh, some more under there. I think there's a, that's a chair right there, okay? Okay, yes, there's the chair right here. What Carter did, he was very clever about this. This didn't require actual excavation as far as digging is concerned. This is tomb clearance, and it's done a little different than, than um, your, your regular stratigraphic digging, okay, where you're digging down through the layers of the ground. Right, so what he did was he numbered every single item in here, and then slowly, one by one, he took them out of the tomb, he uh, cleaned them up by brushing them off, 
um, did whatever kind of uh, minor repairs. If there was something that was sort of falling apart, he tried to stabilize it. He photographed it, gave full descriptions of it, and um, it, this took him a tremendous amount of time. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you right now, um, he didn't finish clearing this tomb completely until 1932. It took him 10 years to get everything out. All right. So anyway, um, this chair, I want to uh, show you this you know, here, because um, in the 1920s, chairs like this and little stools like that became tremendously popular. As a matter of fact, uh, my wife and I have one of these things from the 1920s in our living room, you know, and it's called a Thebes stool. You know, and I looked at that the first time and said, that's Egyptian. You know? <laughs> and, but it, it's not. It's, it was made in the United States. But um, that's part of Tutmania that was going on. All right, so um, this is the west wall. And that, these, <coughs> this is alabaster. These things, you, you, if you see these things in real life, they're just incredible, the workmanship that's on these things. And of course, here you would have had the, the pharaoh's cartouche with his name and hieroglyphics and that. Unguents would have been kept in these things, perfumes and that. Um, the Egyptians bathed quite frequently, okay? They, they would bathe quite frequently, but there was no deodorant or anything like that. So what they would do is they would take unguents, and, and sometimes these, they would, you, the upper classes would wear wigs. Um, they would put cones of oils that were solidified, and during the, the day, these, the hot uh, uh, sun would melt these cones and drip down over their wigs and perfume them. And uh, we know that uh, the Egyptians evidently really liked the smell of turpentine because that's what it smelled oh, like. <laughs> you know. So anyway, they, they, they like that. Anyway, so here's the Thebes chair I'm talking about. Um, our little stool doesn't have the back and the sides and that type of thing. And these, this is gold right in through here. This again is one of Burton's original photographs. This is one they did not colorize. But it certainly gives you the idea. But our stool looks almost exactly like that from, from here down. All right, um, then we have the antechamber, uh, the south wall, and you see a couple more beds uh, that they've got in here. These would be sacks of grain and that type of thing that he would have had, okay? Um, we find, um, this is a neat little thing right here. This was a, a portable stool. Um, this, you know, it looks like a an animal cloth. It was actually carved out of wood, and the little spots you see in it were actually ivory from uh, you know, uh, elephant tusks and that, and it was put in there to make it look like a leopard skin uh, draped over the top. And you can see it's got crossed you know, uh, things like that. You take that top off and fold it up. This is a folding chair. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you think what you're sitting right now, uh, sitting right now, this is not a new idea. <laughs> right. OK, and of course, um, he had at least two chariots uh, in there, and I think part of a third, uh, but two. And when you see these things actually uh, put together in the Egyptian museum, um, it's an amazing piece of equipment. Um, they, they, uh, the axle was right at the very end of the car, the chariot, right along through here like that. And they literally could turn on a dime. Tremendously mobile. And uh, uh, no question they were really good platforms for uh, archers in, in war. Okay, then we have the annex uh, here. And uh, this was a little more jumbled. We think that you know, the thieves may have gotten into this. We're not sure. Um, because these things, this is how they found it. Uh, they're like that. Another chair that was turned over and that. A lot of different pots. Fortunately, they didn't break many of them and that. Um, and this is where we found a lot of these Schwabti figures. A Schwabti figure is an interesting thing in the fact that when you were an Egyptian and you went into the afterlife, you wanted to enjoy yourself. You didn't have to have, want to have to work, right? But a lot of times the gods would come to you and say, okay, it's time for you to go work in the fields. Well, you didn't want to do that. So the Schwabti figure, the, the hieroglyphic inscription on here, um, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, but it says something like, uh, O thou Schwabti, when I'm called upon to do work in the afterlife, thou shalt you know, answer to the gods, here I am, I will do it for him. So this is, your, this is your little slave that would do your work for you. And then you could go off and have a picnic, you know. All right. OK, 
Then the burial chamber, eventually they did that. They broke into this, and here you see Carter and one of his, his, uh, his head workmen uh, opening up the uh, shrine there uh, and, and looking at the sarcophagus for the <laughs> first time. Eventually, this shrine was taken down, and in this picture, we see that here's the sarcophagus and one of the outer coffins right here like this. There's the, the stone lid that has come off of it, and Carter is uh, examining the, the actual mummy uh, case itself. Then we have the treasury, and this is uh, looking uh, from the burial chamber into the, uh, the treasury here, looking east. This is the shrine where the canopic jars were pl placed. That uh, there were four of them, and uh, they would have contained the uh, heart or the liver. I'm sorry, the liver and the lungs and the stomach and intestines, and uh, those would have all been mummified and, and put in there. The one thing that was not put into a canopic jar was the heart, because the Egyptians believed that the heart was the center of intelligence. It wasn't your brain. You know, it was your heart. So if they took the heart out, what they would do is they would mummify that, wrap it up, and put it back in the body. You had to have that. Mm -hmm. Your brain wasn't very important. They would, the first step of mummification is stick a hot poker up in there and, and scramble your brains and, and, and drain it out through the nose. You didn't need your brain. Right. So, um, you know, that's, that's the shrine there. And uh, this is Selkek, one of the uh, goddesses of the underworld helping to protect the, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Kenobi jars. Uh, this is Hathor, you know, the cow uh, goddess. These are caskets here um, that uh, would have uh, had all sorts of clothing and, and things like that for the afterlife. And uh, also, on the other wall, um, notice the boats you have here. One of the stories is that when a pharaoh died, he arose to the sun god, and when he did that, he was allowed to follow the sun god in his path across the sky. The sun god had a boat, and he had the disk of the sun in the boat, so he would sail the boat across the sky from the east all the way to the west, and then travel down through the underworld in the darkness and that sort of thing, come up the next morning, and the whole thing would repeat itself. So Tutankhamun, being the pharaoh, um, he had to have boats to be able to follow the, the sun god there. So that's the reason why he had so many of these little boats, you know, uh, to symbolically be able to follow the sun god there. All right, well, um, as they remove things from the tomb, ladies and gentlemen, um, there was a lot of conservation work uh, was done. I only just uh, today found um, a website uh, from the Griffith Institute um, in um, Oxford, uh, the University of Oxford, and they have now digitized online all of Carter's notes in his own handwriting. And, you know, they talk about every single artifact that he took out of the tomb, what was done to it, where it was photographed, and that type of thing. Uh, it's an amazing archive. But here you see one of the chariots here, one of the chariots. Um, the, the axle would have come out this way, the wheel would have been here like that. And these chariots usually were pulled only by two horses. You only need, these were very, very light. Okay, and they actually had, um, you know, the flooring wasn't the solid flooring. Usually it was strips of leather that were interwoven with one another. Now, you'd think, why, why wouldn't they just have a wooden, you know, platform to stand on? Well, um, Egypt, even though it's filled with sand, can be quite bumpy, right? And the leather strips actually flexed. So when you went over a bump, it was almost like a shock absorber. You know, and that's what was very important because if you were drawing, uh, you know, a, a bow to fire at a lion or something like that, and you hit a bump, you know, you, you, you'd help steady the bow like that. So these were actually pretty stable vehicles to, uh, to, to use in, in uh, hunting in both, uh, uh, you know, warfare and that. Um, but here they're, they're looking at the gold um, plating that's on there, trying to, to um, you know, uh, um, replace some of it if it needed it, and that type of thing. So, um, you know, they did uh, this with, you know, with every artifact, you know, taking a look at what they needed to do. All right, now, the thing about uh, Tutankhamun's tomb, 
um, I could not possibly you know, give this lecture without talking about this, <laughs> the mummy's curse, yeah. right? Well, here's the thing. Um, there were a number of people that died of very odd circumstances. For instance, Lord Carnarvon died in 1923, okay? He was the one that financed the project. And he died because in Egypt, he was bitten by a mosquito. Yes, they have mosquitoes in Egypt. Yeah, especially around the banks of the Nile. He was bitten by a mosquito in the cheek. And one thing about the desert, you might not think this would be the case, but it's really easy for wounds to turn septic in the desert. Okay, so if you get a cut, you want to make sure you uh, wash it cleanly and, and get it taken care of with antibiotics and that sort of thing, right? Carnivan didn't, didn't think much of it. The wound became septic, it um, festered and that sort of thing, and eventually uh, he died of blood poisoning as a result of it, okay? And when that happened, people said, whoa, he shouldn't have gone in that tomb, you know. Another individual who died, um, mysteriously in 1924, the next year, um, Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, he was an x-ray technician that took x-rays of uh, Tutankhamun's, um, you know, Tutankhamun's uh, you know, body and that type of thing. He died under mysterious circumstances. We no, nobody knows what happened. Um, they didn't think it was natural, but they weren't sure that it was was you know murder either. Um, Sir Arthur or uh, Arthur Mace, who was on the excavation team there, died of arsenic poisoning in, in, in 1928. No one knows quite how he managed to be fed arsenic, right? And then Carter's own secretary, Richard Bethel, uh, died suspiciously in 1929. So a lot of people were dying under mysterious circumstances and people were saying, boy, um, it's, this seems, seems odd that they would be doing this. Now here's the thing, Carter had given exclusive rights to the Times of London in order to um, you know, uh, publish information about the day. Now there were a lot of other newspapers in Britain that were really cheesed off that they couldn't get any scoops, not the least of which was the Daily Mail. Right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, somebody, some people put out there that, that there had been this inscription in the tomb. <laughs> they who enter this sacred tomb shall swift, uh, swift be visited by wings of death. Okay? And that was rumored to have been inscribed in the tomb. There's only one problem with this. You know, there's, a, there's no inscription like that in the tomb at all. <laughs> You know, wasn't there. Wasn't on any of the grave goods. It wasn't on his coffin. No place, right? The other thing, too, it was written in English, you know, okay? This was, this was and it's now believed that, uh, that a reporter, because he was cheesed off over not being given a scoop, you know, and that sort of thing, that he started this thing. And the fact that these people had died in mysterious circumstances, you know, was, you know, that's lended credence to it. And there are people that still believe that there's some kind of a curse even to this day. I know back in the 1970s, uh, somebody just asked me if I'd seen the, oh, the thing was Martha, uh, asked me if I had uh, uh, seen the, thing, the uh, exhibit when it came around in the 1970s. Uh, supposedly, I think it was in Washington or in um, uh, New York City where it had visited. One of the guards who was uh, stationed there with the death mask there, uh, you know, in the museum, uh, the uh, uh, you know fellow claimed that he had suffered from bad health, and he believed it was the curse, you know, because he'd been in the, the presence of the death mask for for about a month or so, you know. Well, I don't know, folks. I mean, I've seen this just about every time it's come to America. I've, I've seen it in uh, in the UK. I've seen the stuff three or four times in the uh, Egyptian museum, and I'm still here. So, you know. Now, the other thing, too, is the person who really should have died from all of this was who? Carter. Carter. And he lived till 1932. Or, no, no, 39, I'm sorry, no, 1939. So he lived a long life. Okay, well, here's Carter and his staff. This is 1923. Um, Arthur Callender is, is here on this. Here's Arthur Mace. This is one of the fellows who would die of the curse. And of course, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, Mace here. This is Harry Burton. This is the photographer. You know, right next to, to Carter here. 
and uh, we find that this is Sir Alan Gardner. Alan Gardner was, a, uh, was an Egyptologist of the first level, right? Great, a great man. And to this day, his you know, Egyptian grammar, Middle Egyptian grammar, is the, the thing that most everyone who ever learns hieroglyphics learns out of his book, even yet to this day. You know, uh, just an amazing uh, linguist in that. And then, of course, Alfred Lucas here. Now, this brings me pretty much to the end of my remarks. Um, I will say the importance of Tutankhamun's uh, tomb's discovery is that it really did fire the imaginations of, of people about the existence of, of archaeological um, you know, uh, discoveries, not just in Egypt, but in, in other places in the world as well. It seems that since the time period of, of 1922, when the tomb was discovered, everyone, no matter what branch of archaeology they, they, look, you know, they, they work in, they really you know, are hoping to come up with that Tutankhamun's tomb of, of that era, you know, of that area, and that sort of thing. And, and we found things, like good case in point, the uh, clay, uh, you know, figures that were found in China, for instance, and, uh, um, you know, that's a good case in point. Um, the other thing, too, is Tutmania became a real thing in the, in the 20s and 30s. Um, the Egyptian motifs were used. Uh, they, it became wildly popular. Um, jewelry was, was made. Hairstyles mimic the old Egyptian type of um, you know, fine braid, uh, uh, braided hairstyles. Fabric, furniture, and architecture. And as a matter of fact, if you go around to uh, a lot of the cemeteries here in the United States that date to around the 1920s and the 1930s and that sort of thing, what are you going to find? You're going to find mausoleums that are built in the Egyptian style and that sort of thing. Uh, my wife is kind of an expert with, uh, you know, uh, taking a look at uh, uh, different uh, architectures of, uh, uh, you know, cemeteries and that, and uh, they're just so easy. Uh, if you see obelisks in the cemeteries, right? Obelisks are, are, are Egyptian, you know, and that was really popular in the 20s and 30s, the obelisks and that, that sort of thing. So there you go, that's, that's Tutankhamun, and 100 years ago it was discovered. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess we've got some time. Uh, yeah, we do. Um, so I ended just about right on time. Uh, any uh, questions that uh, you have? Yeah. They have no idea what happened to the other stuff that was robbed out of those tombs? Or well, did he ever find some of the remnants of it? Or? They have found things from time to time that are not in the Egyptian Museum, not at High Clare Castle and that sort of thing, that are on the market and that. So things turn up once in a while. But I'll, I'll be frank with you, very little was probably taken out of the tomb. We, we know that some stuff was, was looted, but uh, this tomb was almost totally intact. Well, I'm talking about the other tombs that Oh, the other tombs. The other tombs oh, the yeah, the other tombs that were robbed out there in, uh, um, you know, in the uh, in the Valley of the Kings. Yeah, they they find stuff all the time, you know, in different collections around the world and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You said he was in the the burial mass that we see was the third casket. That was covering the actual mummy itself. That wasn't actually part of a casket. That was actually, you know, over the top of the mummy. The head of the other two yeah. that were on top. Yeah. Were they carved and things? Yes, they're carved. Well, I'll tell you what they were. They were carved, and what they would oftentimes do uh, with these things, they would take wood, and then what they would do is lay strips of linen that had plaster of Paris, you know, on them and that sort of thing, and they could sculpt the uh, person's face with that, and then those would be painted, gold leaf would be put on them, and that type of thing, yeah. Was it common to have th three of those? Yeah, for, for royal burials and that sort of thing, three, sometimes even four. Oh. Yeah, and that sort of thing. Now obviously, an individual who was uh, kind of middle of the road, not a, a peasant, but somebody who was actually, uh, had maybe a, an overseer that had, he would have a coffin, um, but it would only be one. And that probably wasn't made out of wood. There was a form, and they would just do the plaster of Paris and the linen, and that sort of thing. 
right? Now, by the way, one thing is about that, okay? Because they knew that they could take plaster of Paris and linen and make a hard copy of that, one of the things that the Egyptian physicians found out is that if you had a broken arm or something like that, you had to immobilize the arm. And what they would do is they would lay plaster of Paris you know, with linen and basically they were making casts just like doctors used to do when we were young. Yeah, that's how, that's how far that goes back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the tomb was fairly close to uh, one of the other tombs and that he had died fairly young and mm -hmm. that had uh, possibly been a meant for someone else. Mm -hmm. Was there any work done that showed they might have been trying to link it to the other tomb? Uh, no, there wasn't. And the reason why is because um, Ramesses the sixth tomb uh, actually goes into the hillside and pretty much goes straight back whereas Tutankhamun's tomb went down and then under. So it was underground and that sort of thing. There's no, there's no uh, evidence that they... Now some people have said that behind some of the walls there seem to be blank spaces and this is only just recently in the past couple of years that they've done um, you know, radiograph uh, you know, images back there but there's nothing conclusive and no one wants to you know, uh, damage the tomb you know, to find out. So this is the reason why they're using x-rays and, and radiographs and that type of thing. But there doesn't appear to be any possibility that they try to link it to Ramesses the sixth tomb. I'll tell you what happened. When uh, Tutankhamun uh, died and they buried him there, they buried the entrance to try to protect the, the tomb. Um, nobody knew the, these workers that were working in the Valley of the Kings, probably on some of those tombs, including Ramesses the sixth. They built that not realizing that they were building their huts right over top of the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb. And that's the thing. Nobody thought in 1922 or earlier that, that listen, why would the tomb be under those buildings? Why would they be, be under those huts? But that was the only place he hadn't looked yet. And that's where it was. I, I had a question. Now, you're saying, when was Ramsey II? Where is he in the, higher, in the, in the time scale? Was Tutankhamun prior to significantly before him? Was, what would be the time scale? Not, not significantly, no. Um, you know, here's the thing. Um, you know, uh, you're talking maybe 50 years. Um, because uh, Tutankhamun dies, um, well, not even that long, 20, 23 years. He dies about 19, or, uh, uh, 1323 BC, right? And then his vizier takes over as Pharaoh, um, and he probably wasn't even in the royal line, but he took over. And he only reigned for two years because he was a really old man, you know. And then Horemheb takes over, he was Tutankhamun's general who probably was a blood relation, but he only reigns for um, probably 10, 15 years, something like that, dies, because right around 1308, right, we have a new family come to power, Ramesses I, and then he's followed by his son, Seti I, who was the father of Ramesses II. So uh, Ramesses II, right around 12, uh, 1297, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, uh, the, the Ramesses II was right around the same time as the Trojan War. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, there's other stuff going on in the world at this time. And it's thought that uh, Ramesses II is likely the pharaoh that would have known Moses. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And we do know Moses actually, that name, Moses is not a, not a Hebrew name. Ra more than likely, when that baby was found in the uh, Nile River, he probably was called Tut Moses or maybe Ra Moses or something like that. When Moses found out he was actually a Hebrew, he <coughs> wouldn't have had the Egyptian god's names there. He just became Moses. Hmm. Yeah, but that's actually, that's actually an Egyptian name. It's not Hebrew. Yeah. I saw a history of the burial of Genghis Khan, mm -hmm. and they said that they described it as he wanted to be where nobody could find him. Mm -hmm. So he took a group of his warriors, they took him to a place and buried him. The soldiers that were following that group mm -hmm. executed them mm -hmm. all. 
then those soldiers were executed by another. Did that happen yes. in burials mm -hmm. in Egypt? Egypt? The, um, no, um, not that we know of. Um, they tried to hide the entrances and that sort of thing, and usually guards were sent. Okay. But now, when you had a pyramid, you can't really hide those. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And by the way, pyramids were not just only done during the Old Kingdom. Um, they continued right on through the Middle Kingdom, the 12th and 13th dynasties as well. And we find that small pyramids uh, are found. When I was uh, there uh, visiting the Valley of the Kings the last time, we saw some of the, the tombs of the nobles and that, and they have small mud brick pyramids. You know? <laughs> Uh, and that's very important to Egyptian theology because when a person dies, they, you know, especially a pharaoh, they were to ascend to the sun god on a solidified ray of the sun. Well, if you look up in the sky, sometimes and you see the sun streaming down through the clouds, what does it look like? A pyramid. Yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So you said he was like uh, the son of Akhenaten. I read a lot on Akhenaten and how he was a heretic, like you were mm -hmm. saying, and how they like I uh, saw they scribed out his name and lots of things. Do you think that's why that they never really disturbed his tomb because people didn't care for him at the time, so they they forgot about him and left him alone? Or well, more than likely because Tutankhamun died after only nine years and was mm -hmm. only eighteen years old. More than likely, they literally just forgot about him. Um, as I said, he was pretty much told what to do, believe it or not, even though he was a pharaoh. Um, and believe me, his, his vizier and his general, once they became pharaohs, they didn't really want to remember this kid anyway. <laughs> Let's just forget about him. Um, yeah. Um, I, it, he may have had some of the taint, in a sense, of the heretic pharaoh's family upon him and that sort of thing, but likely because he returned to Egypt to the, the, the traditional gods, um, you know, likely, you know, it wasn't the case where they tried to uh, blot his name out. As a matter of fact, we find it all over. But you are indeed correct. They did try to blot out any trace of Akhenaten. Yeah. I've, Didn't well, work, though. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I watched a lot of videos where they were finding the stuff behind where they had blocked it out and they were trying mm -hmm. to refine what what was there before. They're doing that right now at the Temple of Karnak. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because uh, Akhenaten had built quite a bit, you know, and uh, they tried to, to uh, erase his, his name from history. The Egyptians had a saying, to speak a man's name is to make him live again. And so if you never spoke the name of Akhenaten, he couldn't live. Not in the afterlife. Didn't he build a new capital? Yes, he did. Yeah. Tel El Amarna is what it's called now. It was called Akit Aten, which means the horizon of Aten. Yeah. Now, that was abandoned after his... Now, Tutankhamun probably indeed spent a lot of time there as, you know, as a very young child. But once, you know, Akhenaten died. By the way, uh, we, you know, Zaki Hawass, who had been the, um, you know, uh, the head of the uh, Egyptian Antiquities Service, I can say this, that uh, Zaki Hawass is pretty sure that actually we have actually located the mummy of, of Akhenaten. And if we had, if we have, if that's who it is, that's going to answer a lot of questions. Uh -huh. We know that they found that Shepsut. Is that just recently they got this mummy? Or? Yeah, uh, well they've had it. They just never were able to Identify. make the, but DNA is the thing that's, that's coming forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So they're pretty. We know that the mummy that he's talking about is a very, very close relative to Tutankhamun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, but Egyptians didn't really write histories of things, right? I mean, basically they document things on Pharaoh's uh, legacy and so forth, or or, 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 or things in the tomb. They didn't really, or did they? Well, uh, you know, in the tombs. Most of what you would have seen were going to be passages from the Book of the Dead. Yeah. You know, earlier on in the Middle Kingdom tombs and that, you would find you know, uh, stuff written on the coffins and on the walls, which we call the coffin text. And if you go back to the Old Kingdom, the Pyramid Age of the 5th and 6th dynasties, then you find the, the writings on the walls of the pyramids. But these are all religious writings. Yeah. Now, when you go to temples and things of that nature, you're oftentimes going to find uh, texts written on the walls about some military campaign or something like that. 
Um, the problem is that even when you read some of the papyri that they have found, mm -hmm. and they've got tons. By the way, folks, um, there at Abu Shar when we were working, um, we pull up pieces of papyrus that was written in, in Latin or Greek, um, because this Abu Shar was a Roman uh, fortress, uh, their uh, late Roman fortress. These pieces of papyrus look like they were written yesterday. The, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the um, preservation there in dry sand and that sort of thing is just incredible, you know. So it's easy to read this stuff. Um, but the thing about history is, and I don't care what period you're talking about, yes, you're right, they wrote about the nobles and that type of thing. The common man, not so much. But then basically, what do we write about today, to this day? Probably not a whole lot about what's going on in the inner cities in Dayton, you know, that sort of thing, right? So. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been fun. Right. Perhaps we can turn the uh, lights on here and so people can see and not stumble in the dark. All right. Again, to Dr. Brown. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Before Sorry. We, uh, speaking thank of Moses, you. before we let our people go this <laughs> evening, I'm and coming this way. To, okay. Right. It's a song. We want to bring up uh, a couple things. Our next uh, program will be here on uh, Wednesday, December 7th, 7 p.m. And that will be a talk with uh, author Martin Gottlieb. And his book is called Lincoln's Northern Nemesis. It's about Clement Melendingham. If you don't know who that is, you need to be here to hear that. Very interesting character. Uh, also, we want to mention that our Holly and Ivy event will be on um, December I think it's Friday the 2nd. We'll get some information out about that. And our uh, Christmas at the Tavern will be on Sunday, December 4th. So thank you all very much. Thank you for supporting the Miamisburg Historical Society. Drive safely. Let's all have a good evening. Thank you.